All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Last session before the closing remarks today. So we made it. A couple of quick reminders before we get started. Everybody is on mute. Uh, if you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the sessions, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop mobile site. Um, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Dr. Serge Draz. Serge? Thank you, Tracy, and uh, welcome to this last session of the day and of the conference, in fact, and, and we all know with a good dinner, the best, the dessert is always at the end, so uh, that's uh, no reason to get out of it. It's actually something we're looking forward. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jose Han Hernandez and Patrick Berais from Splunk talking about uh, how to improve and accelerate detection rule developments using continuous integration and continuous delivery. Delivery. And before I hand over the floor, uh, I really ask you to add any questions you have to the Q&A. Uh, we will have time for Q&A. Please use this opportunity. And with having said that, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. My name is Patrick Barras. I'm a senior threat research engineer in Splunk. And I like to contribute to open source projects. I'm the author of Attack Range. I'm contributed to security content. And even before I joined Splunk uh, one year ago, I, I, had, I have uh, other couples of open source projects. If you want to follow me, uh, Twitter at Barres underscore Patrick. And I'm Jose Hernandez, uh, senior manager here at Threat Research, also Splunk. Uh, Co-founder of Zenit, which is now Oracle's WAF, uh, also ex-architect at uh, Prolexic, which is now Akamai, longtime Splunker, and also contributor to you know, open source projects, uh, and super excited to share with Patrick uh, some of the stuff we've been doing at Splunk. So before we jump in, just to give you a little bit of a background of, of what our team does at Splunk, and again, just a TLDR, is we focus on studying vulnerabilities, actors, or threats out there. We then attempt to emulate that attack or whatever technique that, that actors are invoking and generating data sets out of that to then build detections. And as part of this process, we tend to build tools to make our work a lot easier, e.g. the attack range. Uh, it's one of those tools that we built and we like to share these tools and our findings with the community. That's, that's, these are kind of one of the primary drivers or these are the primary drivers of our team and what we try to focus on. Um, yeah. I will focus on the first part. And the first part will, will focus on why detection development is hard. I try to lay out all the challenges what we blue team have when we develop detections. And uh, sometimes it's also related to things with the tools. Let's get it started. In order to understand it, um, or to give a little bit more practical example, I want to start with a very simple technique, a uh, very simple attack. You can see here a credential dumping technique. Credential dumping focusing on dumping credentials to obtain logging and credential material, which they can, which they can use in the next stages of the attack, for example, for lateral movement. It can be either clear text credentials or hashes. In this example, the attacker used the built-in tool correct.exe to dump the security hive. The security hive contains sensitive information. When the attacker is doing it, that will create a log file. In this case, you see a Sysmon log file. Sysmon is an additional uh, tool from Sysinternals, which you can install, and it brings you better visibilities in your Windows logs. It contains like fields like image, um, user, command line, and so on. In this case, we directly see what, what was executed on the command line. When we then have a theme uh, deployed, these kind of logs are getting forwarded to a theme. Um, doesn't matter if you use Splunk or not, all the tools are working the same in, in this terms. You see here the forwarded log into the Splunk system. And then the next step 
is that the log is getting passed, that we have key value pairs in order that we can we can work um, with the logs, that we can write our detections. This is in Splunk, it calls technical add-ons. And this is normally not enough because when you would have like uh, different logs, you would have different naming of fields. That's why um, Seam vendors try to implement their own common information schema. In uh, Splunk, it's called common information model. And that will then um, normalize the data. Here in this example, you see like that command line, command line is mapped to process, image is mapped to process name, process ID to process ID from the data model processes. And by doing that, we can write detections for multiple products based on that normalized data format. Otherwise, you would have a lot of issues for example, network logs, one one time the, lo uh, the name of the field would be SOC underscore IP. Sometimes it would be source IP, uppercase, without an underscore, and so on. That's why a normalized, normalized key value pairs are needed. And then the next step is we can then use that normalized field to write detections. In this case, it's not important that you know the uh, query language of Splunk or not. In this case, we have then using this data models, and you see like the, the part which is highlighted in red, to make key value pairs to map on certain behaviors what the attacker did. In this case, we were able to detect the attack. There, and I also want to write, talk a little bit about different types of detections um, because we often had a lot of have a lot of discussions about that, and that's why uh, I want to talk a little bit about it. There exist two type of detection: there are signature-based detections and anomaly-based detections. The previous example was a typical example of a signature-based detections of a and they signature-based detections are focusing on known threats. Another type of detections are normally based, based detections. For example, if your standard outgoing network traffic produces 100 megabytes a day, and you have now a spike to two gigabytes a day, then this can be catched by anomaly based detection. In order to understand what is the advantages and disadvantages of both types of detections, I have here the um, a detection accuracy diagram, and this is called ROC diagram. The goal of our detection is to be in the left top corner, which means high true positive rate and low false positive rate. When we now have a look to anomaly based detection, signature based detection, we can see that we can, when we probably tune our detection, signature based detections can have a very high true positive rate with a very low false positive rate. For anomaly based detection, this could be um, also, we can also reach a huge two, uh, big two positive rate, but often there's also a, a certain amount of false, pos false positives in there. For example, in this case, when for, with my previous example, when in one of a um, team lead uploaded two gigabytes of data because of the last Christmas party, this will raise alert in the SOC because the average is like 100 megabytes. It's an anomaly, but it's not a malicious uh, behavior. When we only see that diagram, we would say, yeah, let's only go for signature-based detections. But that is, that is not true. I want to show you now another diagram because why both detection types are necessary. Anomaly-based detections can focus with some anomaly-based detection can cover a lot of different malware. They can cover a complete malware families with similar behavior with lower number of anomaly detections. Whereby signature-based detections are normally very targeted. When you saw a credential dumping attack, that was one out of 20, 30, 40 different ways of doing credential dumping. And this was already very specialized and can only detect this certain way of doing credential dumping, which means in terms of uh, general, in terms of 
availability or able to capability of detecting more different kind of malware and normally based detections has advantage. That's why we need both kind of detections in order to be successful. And now I want to talk about another topic, detection depend dependencies. Often people think, yeah, we only write a detection, everything is fine. But we are depending on a lot of different other things are working correct. For example, if the Windows settings are configured properly, if there is changes that could break the logging, could break our detection. Same with the sysmon config. When we have a um, good detection, but the sysmon config is not tuned for the detection and the event is not generated because it's in a, in a white list of the sysmon config, then our detection will not work. When the theme changes, the version changes and some important features change, our detection could be not working anymore. And the same for the technical add-ons, which are the, the, the apps which are responsible for parsing the key value pairs out of the logs. This is also often uh, changing. And we need to make sure that, um, that our detection is working all the time. And of course, also data bonds. Let, let me give you an example to, to highlight that, why we need to then test so often our detection to make it work. For example, we have 30 detections for Sysmon. When we have changes in Windows, we should test the detections. If we have changes in Sysmon uh, version, Sysmon configuration, we need to change the detections and so on. Which means in the worst case, when not everything happened here, the changes at the same time, we need to do a lot of testing. And that's why we are here and talking about how to use CI, CD, A4 detection engineering, because this process needs to be automated. We need to be able to test the detection automatically all the time in order to ensure that they are still working. But there's also different points like threat landscape. The, our, our, the different ATP groups, uh, APT groups, they are getting better and better. They're using probably CI, CD to, de to develop their tools, which means we need to keep up with their speed. And we need to have shortened development life cycles for our detection. When there's a new exploit out there, for example, zero logon, it, could, it can't that, uh, it take for us like two, three months until we have a proper detection. In that whole presentation, we show you some examples. These examples are from our Splunk security content repository, and it contains a lot of open source detection rules. And they are, op they are available in, in GitHub, but also on the Splunk app website. In order to, to show the CICD workflow, we took a workflow from software engineering, which consists of committing changes, triggering a build, then create a build, notify build outcome, run tests, notify of test outcome, and then at the end deploying. And we turn that well-known workflow to apply it, to apply it on for detection engineering. And of course it will guide you through the process. Thank you so much, Patrick, for that background and, and why is it so challenging for us to develop detections in the first place as practitioners? Let's dig really. Uh, let's let's dig into the actual process of detection engineering and what we try to follow. So the first step here that we, we when we start building a detection is we first commit a detection into some code base, right? Um, let's look at what a detection looks like in the first place for us. So detection essentially contains a name for us. Uh, there's a description behind it. The most important part here is essentially there's a search, right, or some way to like query for what you're looking for. Um, as well as in the bottom, if you notice, there's a set of tags, which gives us the metadata around this detection, like the matter ID, what use case this belongs to, so on and so forth. Now, when we commit this detection, we're following in our, in our current processes, a branching workflow for, um, for development. And what that means is we, we usually work off of a develop branch. And if we're developing, you know, developer A is working on detection one, he'll create a branch off of that. And eventually who will create a pull request to be merged into a develop branch. The developer two will create another branch uh, subsequent to that and also will be merged into develop. And eventually once we have everything we need into, into develop and we're happy with what we have to create a release, 
we'll create a tag and that tag is a release version for our detections. And this is how we really do our, the releases in security content. Now, since we're following this process, the next immediate step is for us to convert these detections and package it into something that the system can, can leverage, right? Any system, any SIM out there can leverage. In our case, we're developing the detections in security content using YAML, and we built a script called generate a PY that converts this YAML into safesearches.com, which is the configuration file that Splunk uh, basically reads in for the actual searches. Now, this is what our, again, what a YAML looks like. And once we run it through generate the PY, this is what generate, the, uh, uh, generate provides for us. Basically, this is the uh, .com version for Splunk. And you can see that it has the same information somewhat the YAML contains, just uh, putting it in fields that it, uh, Splunk can read and understand, essentially, and take advantage of them. Now, as part of packaging, we also have uh, uh, in CICD a job that not only takes these YAML, uh, this safe searches account, but also creates a Splunk package for us. In, in, in this case, it's a Splunk app called the ECU, which is what we ship. And this is part of, again, the CICD process, which first validate the content, we build what we call build sources, basically generating the safe searches account, and then we build a, a that .spl file and we run app inspect on that file. App inspect is a, an API provided by Splunk that verifies that you've, you're, you have a app built per their specifications and you're not doing something funky on this app essentially. Now, once a package, uh, once the detections have been converted to the appropriate system is gonna get shipped into and it's been packaged appropriately and we tested this package, we then get a notification of this build outcome. Now, what this looks like is, again, typically we'll start off with a developer creating a PR, uh, a pull request in this case, and that PR has any number of uh, uh, tests that it runs automatically. And this, again, this is CI that runs these tests automatically. Developers are doing nothing in, in this case and saves a lot of time for us, right? But um, in this case, there's a bunch of tests that run automatically. Like I mentioned earlier, building the package, validating that the YAML is correct, validating the fact that there's not um, a misspelling or you're, 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 you're using a field incorrectly on that YAML since we have a specification behind it. And then essentially validating that the package was built correctly. This happens under the hood on every on every PR. Right? Now, this doesn't necessarily test the detection, which is our next immediate test, uh, our next immediate task, which is actually testing the detection that the developer is committed in there. To test the detection, we should quickly review the detection development process again from a high level. We first start with, let's say, an act, uh, an attack technique, and then from that technique, we generate a data set. And from that data set, we all develop a detection as well as a set of what we call detection tests. We'll go into that in a second. And then that detection test goes into a testing pipeline from a service that we develop that actually uh, runs those tests. And finally, we, we ship that detection to all compatible Splunk products after that's been tested properly. Now, these steps are usually broken down in our team by different roles. Doesn't mean that not one of us wears multiple roles. It's just we typically just have to, we break this into different roles. Typically, the uh, engineer generating data set is doing uh, is the adversary emulation engineer. The engineer developing the detection is a detection developer. We have one for actual uh, 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 the same. Sometimes the detection developer is also doing the actual uh, testing. Although there's an engineer that manages the testing platform and the release to the community and to the products is managed by a community community developer. We all will end up writing some sort of blog as a result of a uh, very important detection. Like for example, we just recently wrote on Ryuk ransomware. Now, these individual roles have tools that we developed. Again, and we've open sourced some of these, uh, actually most of these are uh, taken under the hood. The, the, Data set generation, which is done by the adversarial, uh, 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 adversarial emulation engineer, is it's leveraging under the hood the attack data repository project. We, we recently open sourced in, in Splunk conference in October, which is a repository of attack data, essentially, we collect. And this is done by uh, automatically also by a data set generation service that's on that project. Given some sort of a MITRE technique, it generates a data set for you. The next tool that comes into play is the attack range or the cloud attack range, depending on what kind of detection you're developing, which is the environment 
well, it's a tool that allows us to build an environment uh, uh, replicably that has a Splunk server plus some sort of endpoint or some sort of a, a, a machine that we can attack our service. Then those two those two uh, pieces are connected and they talk to each other, right? That the service or the endpoint is logged into Splunk, and then from there we can uh, uh, either gather data sets or uh, closely study what that attack did. Now. From the attack range and, and, and the detection developer, while he's working on the attack range, he'll, he'll have a data set that he, he's, he's working with as well as simulations he's emulating. Then when he's done there, he'll produce a test file with from that data set and using, uh, uh, and, and, the, and using the detection he's developed. And that test file essentially is put into this detection testing service that automatically verifies whether that, that detection is passing or not. And then this is all ultimately committed back into security content, which is the repository where we keep all of our uh, all of our detections. I'm going to speed through this since we only have five minutes on the clock. So again, a really high level. This is the uh, attack range uh, architecture. It builds attack, it builds and attacks, and it's doing this on the hood using Ansible and Terraform essentially, and it builds it on, on AWS cloud environment. I'm not going to go into the details. It's really well documented. Highly check, uh, highly recommend you check out the, the project. But again, detection testing, a little bit more in details here. We start from a uh, MITRE attack technique like LSAS memory. And, and under the hood, uh, using a time of the team, there's any number, any number of attacks for the, that relates to this technique. The, the detection testing service will launch all these attacks, right? And then we'll develop any number of detections associated with these attacks. And, and again, these detections are written by the detection developer and both of these teams are put together in a test file. Um, the test file looks something like this, where you have uh, the name of the detection, some sort of pass condition, and the actual attack uh, data set related to the detection. And again, the attack data set is grabbed from a Tamara team execution. And then this is run through uh, the attack range, which has a, a, a test action. And the attack range, again, builds an environment, replays that attack data, runs the detection and then evaluates whether that passed or failed. That then, uh, it's how we, we evaluate our test outcome. And that then automatically updates the PR saying, hey, this detection was passed. And here is some, you know, here's some statistics on the fact that it passed. Or it failed and, and Mr. Developer, you gotta go check out why it failed. Also as part of that uh, um, the service, it, uh, um, adds a, a meta a, a tag, a metadata tag to the detection called automatic detection testing passed essentially, letting the, any future developers or users know, hey, this detection passed with this data set, a test. And finally, the last step of the workflow is uh, essentially deploying the detection. There's three ways today that we deploy our detections in Splunk. We package it as a Splunk app. We also allow users, especially for larger shops to uh, fork the Git repository and generate their own app using the code that we have in there. But we also provide a completely open uh, and free RESTful API that any, any third-party system can download a, the, the detections from and implement it uh, locally. So how do you apply what you learned today? And uh, first, highly recommend you, again, check out the attack range if, if, you're, if you wanna uh, give it a hand at developing your own detections in the next few weeks. Uh, in the next three months or so, I hope this presentation helps you establish some sort of CI/CD work for your sim to test your detections, and and encourage you to put some tests in there to run uh, to run again to to consistently and continuously validate your detections with these tests. And within the next six months, I I hope you share these detections with the community overall. Again, security content for us is completely open source. Feel free to make a pull request. Also, Sigma Project is a great place to share detections in. Um, we love it. Uh, and and again. I hope within six months, this helps you establish an automated, automatic detection testing in your environment. Thank you. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, this is kind of a, was a really interesting talk. And I think uh, everybody that actually is managing SIM rules uh, should, should really spend some time on that rather than kind of continue suffering uh, from all the manual work we do. Um, there's no questions right now in, in, in the Q&A. Uh, so maybe one question, if, if, if you operate an existing seam and stuff like that, what, what do you think is the best way to actually 
get into that. I mean, there, there's a lot of tools. You have to get familiar with, with Mitre. You have to get familiar with, with Atomic. Any, like, any of your pain points or things that you can share, that how you, you got into that and got up to speed? Patrick, you want me to take this one? I, I can take it, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think it's important that, that, that you already have a set of rules which you can use. For example, that, that's not only us, there's also the other vendors who ship rules. And you can start with the existing rules. Think about it, how, what they cover, how the attack works. And that already helps you to, to understand how it works. And then I would focus, and that's always needed, to some dedicated rules based on your APT groups, which targets your, your vertical. You can then focus some efforts, which, which you have then into writing dedicated rules for your environment. Okay, so we actually do have a question. Uh, uh, Mark Matkins, how would this help in the writing playbooks with, within Phantom Soar? I'll take this one, Patrick, if it's okay with you. Yeah. So, so uh, this presentation specifically was all about detections, um, but we do, our team also develops with playbooks and responses first Planck. Today, um, how this process for us helps us develop those responses is specifically on the attack range tool. We can bring up a phantom, a full phantom server and test whether a detection uh, is addressed or mitigated by a phantom playbook in there. Now, um, we're still working really hard to make an out of the box experience for security content for phantom. It's not there yet, uh, to be completely honest, but, but there are phantom actions, uh, we call them response tasks and playbooks available in security content um, today. Okay, any more questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. So I hope to see you in five minutes in uh, for the closing remarks. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk. I thought this was really interesting. I already recommended this to my team uh, that they should download this. And uh, so Thanks again and talk to you hopefully at some stage in person. Thank you, Serge. And thank you for saving the best for last. Have a good day. Take care. Thanks, guys. <laughs>